and a very well welcome to everyone. Um, so this is uh, another update from Skagen Kontiki after our uh, previous update uh, back in uh, February. So just uh, firstly on um, on the team, uh, no changes here, even though there's lots of uh, changes going on in the market and we're looking forward to giving you an update on what's uh, happened. But uh, the team of Katrina, Espen, Desmond and myself uh, are working uh, continuously to try and uh, make the best of the situation. So um, we come back to, to this uh, chart uh, every presentation, sort of see it as our mission statement. You know, what is Skagen Kontiki? Um, we are an active value-based and unconstrained emerging markets fund. Uh, the key characteristics of the fund is that we have a very high active share, uh, close to 90%, which has been stable over time. This is a large, um, largely driven by our significant exposure to both small and mid-cap uh, mid -cap companies, which make up currently just over 60% of the portfolio. So it's a little bit higher than the 57% we had uh, during our last update. The reason for this is, is really that we use the unconstrained nature of the mandate, and we find that the, the biggest sources of, of mispricings in the market is in these smaller and mid capitalization companies. That is not to say that we don't have large cap exposure. We have a number of larger companies as well, uh, but these tend to be uh, more efficiently priced, uh, we find. In terms of our value uh, credentials, again, we don't run the, the portfolio on sort of uh, target multiples, but you should expect that through a cycle or over time that the portfolio uh, trades at a significant discount to the wider market. However, that is not um, at the expense of quality. Our portfolio has uh, just uh, under 12% ROE on average over the last three years, including uh, during Corona, which is a percentage point higher than that of the broader market. So what we want is a little bit of the best of both worlds, lower valuation without sacrificing uh, on the quality side. And at, at the end of May, with a 30 35% discount to the wider market on both earnings and on price to book, uh, we find that the, the portfolio is well positioned on that basis. In terms of what I want to cover today, I'll give a brief update on, on the market and what's been moving in the portfolio uh, over the last few months. Uh, also give a snapshot of the portfolio today and some of the key drivers of our performance. And then given all the sort of talk about inflation and, and elevated valuation multiples in the market, uh, spend a few minutes just talking about the outlook and the way we are positioned uh, for it. So if we uh, turn to uh, to the broader markets, I mean, it's been another strong year for equity markets year to date, uh, very much continuing in the strong trend from, from the second half. That's also been the case for, for Skagen Kontiki, which uh, as of last Friday was up 12.5% uh, in euro terms year to date, which is a uh, broadly 3.5 percentage points higher than the index return of 89 and it also means that over the last 12 months, um, the return of the fund is 44% in, in euro terms versus 33% for, for the index. So, so quite a material uh, outperformance over the last 12 months. However, unlike in 2020, when uh, value significantly underperformed uh, growth stocks, we've actually seen a bit of a reversal so far in 2021. And as you can see on the right hand side of the chart, value stocks uh, on aggregate um, by the index is up 12.6% year to date, um, roughly seven percentage points ahead of the average growth stock, which is up five and a half percent. Um, so it's pleasing that uh, we've seen a return to, to form of, of sort of our style of investing. And I think given the sort of the outperformance over the last 12 months, uh, we have been able to capitalize on more favorable uh, trends. What's been driving uh, the performance at, of the portfolio level? Um, firstly, with the positive contributors, uh, are by far the biggest contributor year to date is UPL, which is an Indian agrochem chemical uh, company or a crop protection company. And I think what we're seeing there is that with improving farmer economics, driven by higher commodity prices, they are able and willing to spend more on crop pro protection 
uh, because yields become ever more important. It's also the company is increasingly being recognized as a sustainability uh, leader and recently received an award for Asian sustainability leadership um, earlier this month. Also, just like in 2020, our um, uh, African copper uh, company, Ivanhoe Mines, continues to do well. Um, obviously, strong copper prices have helped a lot, but also, as I will return to later in the, in the presentation, we have also got the first of our projects in the DRC up and running, which has been a key trigger uh, for the shares. At CBD and uh, uh, LG Core, which is basically a Brazilian food retailer and a Korean holding company, we've had corporate restructurings at both of these companies, uh, which have highlighted hidden underlying values. Again, uh, a key tenet of our investment thesis on those two companies. On the negative side, um, our biggest detractor this year has been um, Chinese insurance company and, and fintech conglomerate Ping An, which has suffered really from, from a lack of recovery post-COVID in terms of new business uh, sales, and also has suffered sentiment-wise from participating in, in a corporate restructuring of a Chinese SOE called Founder Group. Uh, last year, uh, we also suffered a number of drawdowns in the financials and the energy sector. And this year, we've also had a negative uh, contribution from Brazilian oil company Petrobras. But this time, it's not been because of uh, falling oil prices or, or weak fundamentals. Instead, it's that the government has decided to, to intervene and change management of the company. Um, this was a clear thesis violation for us, so, so we've sold out of uh, that position. Uh, finally, in terms of um, a negative contributors, we've had some teething problems on scaling up of land-based salmon farmer Atlantic Sapphire. Um, those problems seem to be uh, sorted out now. And with us participating in the recent private placement that they did, uh, the company is now fully funded for its second phase expansion. So uh, we look forward to, to a recovery in that stock as well. Many of you will remember from our last update, hopefully, that we talked about the theme of electrification, which we introduced into the portfolio in 2018. It was a, a big theme and positive contributor to the portfolio in 2020, as we'd built exposure throughout the value chain from, from mine to, to auto OEM via battery makers and um, electronic components. Um, this year, it's it's still an important contributor uh, so far this year. However, if you see on the left hand side, we have a couple of stocks that we have highlighted in red, and these are positions that we have actually sold out during um, the period since we initiated uh, this basket. However, the remaining stocks that we have held exposure to have have delivered on average about 10 percentage point out outperformance versus the index this year. So it still remains a, a key driver of the portfolio. As you can also see on the right hand side, a couple of the names like Ivanhoe and, and LG Electronics have, have delivered tremendous returns uh, over that two and a half year period. Uh, and we have actually been reducing some of our holdings here uh, as the a gap to what we've seen as fair value has been closed. And 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 this is basically the the, the sort of continuous optimization we do of the portfolio to make sure that we're balancing uh, the upside that we see, but also with sort of the risk of the market having uh, more adequately priced in what we had previously positioned for. But I, I just want to stress it, it's still an important part of the portfolio and we're well positioned for, for the energy transition with the original basket the components still accounting for, for just over 20% of the overall portfolio. But in terms of as a alpha driver or outperformance driver, we feel that we've taken out a lot of the, um, the upside already. So oh, what have we spent some of that money that we freed up on? Uh, if we turn the, to the portfolio today, um, it's been another busy year in terms of new positions. We've added six new companies to the portfolio so far this year, four of them in China, which has been one of the weaker equity markets here to date, and two of them in Latin America. Our, our new positions are, are across uh, cyclicals, commodities and materials, 
all the way to consumer staples and, and technology companies. So we take the most important ones in turn. In Brazil, uh, we've invested in the uh, pulp producer Susano, which in addition to having a strong commodity price tailwind, also offers excellent sustainability credentials as a forest operator and is currently priced uh, for earnings to enter a down cycle. We actually believe that the fundamentals in, in the pulp market are better than the market gives credit for uh, and, and have been adding to the position as, as the market is fearing a down cycle. Uh, we also have exposure to rising commodity prices in West China cement. Uh, and here what we see is that the government is curtailing supply uh, on the smaller operators on the back of environmental concerns. That means that the bed, better and bigger sort of regional strong strongholds are profitable uh, for longer, uh, which we think is, is not priced in on, on around three to four times price to earnings. Finally, on the commodity side, we also have a position in uh, Chinese oil company Sinuk, which in addition to offering sort of inflation protection on, on rising crude prices, is also a, a very, very well run operation, operationally company that trades at a significant discount to global peers and has a, has a strong balance sheet. And, and we believe importantly, it's aligned with China's energy transition strategy uh, that it has laid out. We've also added a defensive position in China Mobile. This is more of a sort of a classic value uh, investment with 50% of the market cap in cash and a sustainable 7% dividend yield, uh, which we believe is attractive in, in the current environment. Finally, some of you may see that we've added Alibaba. It's a small position for us at the moment. Um, this is the largest Chinese online uh, retailer, uh, which has fallen about 33% since its peak back in October 2020 on a combination of regulatory concerns and rising investment needs, which is putting pressure on near term earnings. Clearly, uh, we have always said over the last few years that we think that some of the risks associated with Chinese tech companies is underappreciated. And what we have seen now is that when these concerns have become more out of the front of mind of other investors, then we've had a significant re-rating of the share downwards, which makes the risk reward in our view much, much more balanced and, and therefore more attractive to us. In terms of the stocks that we've exited, uh, obviously we mentioned Petrobras before, which was a thesis violation on, on government intervention. And the other four that we've exited uh, in 2021 have all been because the, the stocks have reached or gotten close to our target prices. So again, in, in line with our investment process and in terms of managing the positions uh, on the risk reward basis, uh, we've recycled that capital into new ideas. Um, if we look at where the top 12 is today, uh, at the end of that, for the eagle eye of you, there's actually no change in the top six since our fe February update. We continue to see significant upside to, to these stocks. The only one where we have reduced our holding a little bit is in UPL, as, as the stock has had a, a very, very strong performance year to date, up around 80%. Um, Otherwise, uh, there is one exit in the top 12 position, although it's still a holding in the fund, which is Tech Mahindra. This is a stock that we brought to your attention during the summer of last year, having first invested in the company in, in May 2020 during the COVID sell-off. Since then, the stock has roughly doubled in, in euro terms, outperforming the EM index by 60 percentage points and outperformed the local Indian market uh, by around 40 percentage points. So as a result, we've, we've been locking in some of that uh, profit as it has been delivered. Uh, that's been replaced in the top 12 by, uh, by Susano, uh, which, uh, which we mentioned uh, earlier. So on, on, on the whole, in aggregate, we still see through the more, uh, management of the portfolio more than 40 percent upside on the weighted basis to the portfolio. And even if every single stock in the portfolio would trade up to our target prices, the portfolio would still be trading at a discount to the EM index. So I think this is a good example of where 
We've delivered strong returns over the last 12 months through active management of the portfolio. We've maintained an attractive upside and you know the delivery of that upside does not have to rely on excessive valuations coming in. It's merely closing the discount on our portfolio as it stands today. Also want to go through a little bit of Ivanhoe, which I mentioned has uh, reached production. That was a pretty big uh, uh, occasion for us. It was a holding that we introduced into the fund back in 2018. So it's been a three year uh, journey. And, and here you see a flyover of, of their first operational project, Kamoa Kakula in the Democratic Re Republic of, of Congo, which started production last month, two months ahead of schedule and on budget. Uh, we're immensely proud to have been a part of uh, this project. Uh, not only because it has been successful, but also because the way that the company has been able to deliver this project on time and on budget during a, uh, a global pandemic. So it shows that we backed the, the right team. And, and I will just want to talk through a little bit about how we've been working with the company as, as active investors. So early 2018, this, this was merely a, a, what seemed like a potentially good idea. It was an interesting project uh, down in the DRC, obviously high risk and, and huge potential upside, uh, but we had concerns around the obvious political risks and challenges around performing due diligence on a project in um, uh, Southern Africa. Um, what changed for us was on the 11th of June when the company signed a strategic alliance with CITIC, which is a Chinese central SOE, so a state-owned enterprise, and it took a 19.9% stake in the company. That meant that together with the project partner on two of the projects, which is another Chinese SOE called Zijin Mining, meant that the Chinese effective ownership of this key project was over 50% we felt that that massively reduced the operational and political risk of getting the project off the ground. But to our surprise, the stock actually fell uh, on this news. So this is when we initiated the position and you can see in the dark blue line an indication of the size of our uh, position over time. Then we spent uh, the autumn of 2018 with several meetings, uh, including with the executive chairman, the corporate development team, and a visit to the headquarters to go through our assumptions and their expectations for the project. And at the same time, the company continued to make massive discoveries of new potential resources uh, on its land. Um, then in 2019, in early May, we visited all of the three projects in South Africa and the DRC over a period of three days getting the opportunity to speak to local management and the operational team. And that gave us the confidence to continue building our position. And interestingly, at the same time, the strategic Chinese investors continue to put new money into the, the company through primary offerings, which meant that the company at every given point in time was well capitalized uh, to put its projects uh, forward. Then obviously in, um, in early 2020, things changed a lot. Uh, COVID hit, the copper price fell, which you can see in green, and the shares more or less collapsed below the point where we had in initiated the position. Uh, we had several more meetings with, uh, with the company. Management itself bought shares, uh, and so did we. And as you can see on the chart, we'd never had a bigger position in the company than we did when, when the stock bottom in March 2020 at $2.10 versus the close to, to $9 price today. So I think for us, this was a case where our confidence was built over time. Uh, we never doubted the project in terms of its high grade, low cost and the structural demand for copper. And with the sort of cooperation with strategic backers, we felt that the project had uh, every chance of success. What's happened in the last month is that the, the company has actually be, uh, become the first project to commit to a net zero greenhouse gas emission, uh, which means that this will be a net zero mine. And also um, uh, about a month ago, the company was finally included uh, in the MSCI indices. But I think it's worth highlighting that 
you know, the inclusion into the indices is a full three years after our initial investment and at a price th more than three times as high as when we made our ex uh, investment. So I think, you know, it shows a, a good example of where we're using the full extent of our mandate. The fact that it's unconstrained in terms of uh, in the indices and it's unconstrained in terms of our ability to go to a developed market um, uh, exchange, which um, which we did the, here through the Canadian listing. And finally, the extent of our proprietary research on the company to build confidence throughout the case, because it, it's a company uh, which has very, very limited sell side uh, coverage. OK, if we if we turn to the outlook, um, I think, you know, on the whole, uh, a good 2020 in the bag and, and, and global equity market still positive 2021. It should be no surprise that the Bank of America Merrill Lynch investor sentiment is, is sort of a bit somewhere between uh, amber and red, i.e. the most investors are bullishly positioned. For us, the sort of key, in, key question on everyone's lips is, is what happens to inflation? And if we take a, a step back, I think it's it's worth highlighting here that if we look through COVID and just look at where were these commodity prices two years ago and where are they today, it's tremendous the amount of price increases that we've had. You know, the key building blocks of the global economy, iron ore and copper, are both up 60 to 80 percent versus uh, June 2019. Similarly for soft commodities, corn and soybeans again up 60 to 80 percent over a two year period and even oil where you know a significant amount of demand is not recovered post COVID in terms of jet fuel, in terms of miles driven, etc. Even oil is up more than 10 percent um, since pre COVID. So I think it's it's clear that there, are, there is something afoot in terms of inflationary forces in the market, which we have not experienced uh, for a number of years. So how are investors uh, positioned for it? Is it a risk going forward? In our view, possibly so, but it, I think it depends uh, significantly on the duration or whether it's transitory. If we if we consider it to be transitory, then I, then I think it's not much more to worry about. As we can see here again, the key tail risk is identified by the Bank of America Merrill Lynch fund manager survey is that inflation is the biggest risk that they see on their mind. And if you look on the left hand side of the chart, which shows investor positioning in different asset classes relative to the long term history, you can see that there is a very pro cyclical and pro commodity positioning um, versus history. And, the, and these are asset classes that have typically done well in inflationary environments. The flip side of that is relative to history, people are underweight cash fixed income instruments, US dollar uh, and long duration tech. And again, I think those play into the sort of the second biggest risk that people see on the horizon is any kind of Fed tapering, which which uh, is a question of time rather than whether or not it's coming. So I think given what has happened in terms of asset returns and the way that investors are positioned today, I don't think that sort of a transitory inflation uh, picture would uh, give much more uh, sort of upside for cyclical stocks. However, the question is, of course, if it proves to be less than transitory, in that case, I think there is much, much more to go for. And the two previous periods, early 2000s and then uh, the 1970s, give some kind of indication of what a sustained rotation into value uh, could look for and how it could look like and how powerful it might be. So I think if the market does, if the market backdrop has changed with respect to inflation, the places that you want to be are the opposite of the playbook of the last 10 years. We do see a lot of parallels in the market today with where it was in the early 2000s. We've had an extreme underperformance of value going into COVID. We have stretched valuations in parts of the market, but by no means in all. And we've seen a, a number of indicators in terms of retail euphoria. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is that we are seeing accelerating commodity prices because there is a sort of a, a demand uh, acceleration in a period of supply constraint. 
So if you look at the, the US market uh, where we have the best data in terms of rolling 12 month returns value versus growth, we see that these kind of rotations when they come from a position of weakness that we did come from, they don't stop uh, at sort of zero. Uh, the drawdown that the value factor had at the beginning of 2020 of minus 48% is the biggest on record. And I think that the sort of the mean reversionist amongst us uh, will probably think that there is more to go for than for it just to break even on a 12 month basis. And why do we think that the, the, the chances of that are, are reasonably good? Well, it's because the starting point is still very attractive. So even though we've had a sort of what looks like a pretty violent six month rotation back to value, uh, it is a mere blip on the longer term valuation chart. So the spread, so here you see the value versus growth discount in terms of PE and price to book valuation um, at sort of near 50% on earnings and near 60% on price to book, the valuation discount is still extremely high in a historical context. The next uh, thing to point uh, your attention to is that we have a similar characteristics in terms of emerging markets re uh, relative to developed markets and in particular against the US uh, market. And that is that EM, despite sort of having held ground over the last two and a half to three years, is still trading at a 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent discount to developed markets. And that is despite earning similar or higher returns on equity. So that is a measure of the implicit risk uh, or volatility that investors are pricing into the asset class. And when you put the two together, I think it makes for, for a very, very interesting starting point. So for us, in many ways, the market backdrop is reminiscent of when the fund was launched uh, now almost 20 years ago. We have our 20 year anniversary in, in April next year. Here we plot the total return index uh, in green uh, value versus growth within the emerging markets um, setup. So when the green line is falling, value is underperforming and vice versa. And in the blue line, we plot the emerging markets relative return versus developed market. So again, when the blue line is falling, emerging markets are underperforming. And what we have today is that we've come out of a period of extreme underperformance for the value factor. The discount has widened to historically high levels. And we think that that sets us up for, for a potential sustained cycle of, of our performance. And I think even if, if, if you don't believe as, as, as we do that, that this is a, a strong case, as long as you consider the probability of it happening to be non-zero, that the market which has been dominated by US tech uh, that we have known for the last 10 years could change, then we do believe that EM value has a place in a diversified uh, portfolio. So although the fund is up uh, more than 40% over the last 12 months and, and more than 10% ahead of the EM index, uh, I think that we, we have shown that we are in a position to capitalize on the opportunity uh, should it present itself in the way that we think it is at the moment. Before I hand over uh, back to, to Ole Christian, uh, just uh, a summary from, from our side. It's been a good start to 2021 for, for global equities. And so that's given us uh, a, a pretty decent tailwind for the fund as well. I think uh, in terms of team dynamics and operational, uh, operationally what's happening in the portfolio, we have a steady flow of new ideas. And given the sort of this, the very large uh, discrepancies in the market, we are finding a lot of of value opportunities, even though the market has continued to go up. In terms of the portfolio today, uh, it's a quality portfolio, so we're not sort of trading in quality for, for lower price, but it is trading at a significant 35% discount to the market. And what we are seeing are sort of early signs of the change in the market backdrop, um, largely driven by accelerating growth, but also due to uh, potential inflation overshoot. And I think in, in that kind of context, both from a sort of um, positioning perspective, but also from an investment philosophy perspective, I think Skagen Kontiki is, is very well positioned uh, for what we would consider to be uh, a new normal. 
So with that, I, I thank you very much for, for your attention. I hand back to Leticia in, in case we have any follow up question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. Um, indeed, we do have a follow up question which relates to the um, uh, change in the market backdrop that you just talked about. Um, do you think inflation is already calculated in into the market, into the emerging markets, that is? Well, I think what, what we try to, to differentiate between is whether or not inflation is transitory or if it's a, if it's a real change in the market backdrop. I think given the, the returns we've seen from sort of inflation protected assets over the last six months and the positioning we see today, I think if this proves to be short lived, I, I don't think there's a great deal more to, to pick up from it. However, what we've seen is that you know, the origins and what drives inflation are not always easy to, to know in advance. So if we do get sort of a, a longer term overshoot here, or if, you know, uh, the Fed or any other central bank loses control, then, then I think that we are in for, for a very, very different market backdrop, which should work in our favor and emerging markets uh, favor um, if it proves to be less uh, transitory than expected. So I think there is there is definitely uh, a significant potential chance that that we could see a, a period of very different market backdrop.